I got all these cool things and I know how to use them. I got all these cool things and I don't know how to use them. Discipline. Preparation. And a deep abiding knowledge of the material. Oh, the blood. The blood. The Viking blood. Twas spilled on the sea. Twas spilled on me. You, Viking blood on me. Hey, greetings programs, Hank and Fernail here. Welcome to another awesome episode of Drunkens and Dragons. The hand gesture means you're getting pure sincerity. We are here to talk about D&D, because that's what we do. Now, um, I'm gonna, if you can't see, we got the good stuff this evening. I'm just gonna, woo, boy, that's a satisfying sound. Craft supplies, okay, so let's pour this baby up. What is going on tonight, Hankerin, you ask? Because we're only like 30 seconds into the video and you're already, where's the, where's the rich, compelling content? God, these videos are all intro and no substance. Well, not tonight, my furry friend, because we are going to get down to some nuts and bolts. We're gonna get dirty. Actually, no, because the thesis that I provide for the topic is deferential at best. One of the privileges that I get of working on this crazy channel of D&D content, Drunkens and Dragons, is that I get to sit at the helm of a ship of crazy awesome people. Now I'm not really steering that ship, but I can hear what everyone is talking about and I get to benefit from that. So in the past couple of weeks since the last episode, it has been a veritable hotbed of activity because, uh, and I would like to renew this invitation, please PM me directly on Facebook at Drunkens and Dragons with your ideas, questions, photos of your setup, of your game session, your stories, your everything. People uh, hook me up with cool little documents from their campaigns, they ask me questions, they riddle me with challenges. It's fantastic and we're working on better D&D together as a crew. And that's how I like it. Oh, mama. Thus, I come to tonight's topic. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and lose my page here because how important could it be? You've got some books sitting on the table here, and these books matter, my friends. You have probably seen yourself in this situation before. Hey, let me just go through this, uh, this content real quick here, and uh, I'll be ready for the play session next week. Ridiculous. That is a lot of stuff. One of the questions and trends in questions and commentary and discussions that I've been seeing, partially because I joined the Pathfinder RPG Facebook group, and those guys are very engaged in their topic. There's a lot of activity there around Pathfinder. And you know, anybody who has played Pathfinder or knows people that play Pathfinder, there's a lot of passion around that game. D&D 3.5, which is the basis of Pathfinder, is a huge, deep, well-developed game system, all built on D20 with bonus calculation as its fundamental progression and difficulty mechanic. And it's intuitive, it's deeply documented, and Paizo saw that, took the opportunity because they're like, why D&D do you continually change your mechanics? We're just gonna go deep on 3.5 for years and make the, the industry's best source books, best books to collect, and cool pawns and all kinds of things. So the Pathfinder game has a huge, awesome, dedicated following and I want to get in there because the more that I've been collecting, getting my Pathfinder collection built out, the more I realize that my game, which is a 5th edition D&D 5e game, can benefit tremendously from all the cool stuff in Pathfinder. You've already, already felt this. You're in the game store browsing the books, which you totally don't need another book because you haven't even gotten through five or ten of the monsters in the monster manual, but you know that you want more of this crap. 
And so you're looking and there's no denying that the Pathfinder books are exciting. Their box sets are really cool and you just want it. You just, you want the pawn boxes. The art is awesome. Wayne Reynolds is one of the core artists that you probably know and love the most from the Pathfinder covers. And a bevy, a veritable cornucopia, a scad of other artists uh, that make Pathfinder and Paizo awesome. It's a huge, weird digression about Pathfinder to get to the actual meat, the substance, the main course of the D&D meal this evening. Tastes like monkeys, tastes like me, this is the taste of being free. Spices and wine all in a cup, I'm gonna drink this baby up. Pathfinder. Okay, great. So let's say that you agree with the preamble of the video, right? You're like, yeah, okay, dude. I hooked up with that with that first Pathfinder monster manual, right? I got like four. That's maybe a little bit big of an investment for me coming in up front. But I got the first one, and uh, it's mostly just the monsters from my monster manual. So that's a little weird. But I also got the Codex, which is over there somewhere. And I got some other stuff, and I got, you know, Rise of the Rune Lords and other stuff. And this stuff's all really cool, man. I want to put some of this stuff into my game. I want to put the Yellow Musk Creeper into my game. And that's not in my, my 5th edition Monster Manual. There's no Brachiosaurus in d and I want a Brachiosaurus in my, because we're doing a dinosaur hunting party. Which sounds totally awesome. So, how do you take awesome Pathfinder stuff and get it into your D&D game? This is a classic question. You've probably seen it all over the interwebs. How to convert Pathfinder into D&D 5th Edition. Okay, you can use this 50-page PDF that will help you do all the math. Or there's this new phone app that will convert your Pathfinder assets into D&D 5th Edition assets. So, the question coming to me... Uh, hey, Hankering Furnail. How do I convert my favorite Pathfinder campaign monster statistical or especially character class content into D&D 5th edition? Well, you're probably not going to like my answer. How do you convert Pathfinder into D&D 5th edition? Don't. Take the shit straight out of Pathfinder and shove it into your 5th edition game. Take the shit straight out of Pathfinder and shove it into your 5th edition game. Whoa. Heresy. Blasphemy. You shake the pillars of creation with your defiant attitude and grandfather. This is, this is me and you time. This is us time. And I'm going to come clean. Here's what I did. I have more Pathfinder books than this, but this, this really makes the point the best. These four books are all you need. Okay, so you got your, your PHB and your core rule book on the bottom, right? Actually, they're not that useful here. You know, there's a lot of really cool stuff in the Pathfinder core book. The character classes are super cool. And you know, everybody's been giving me hell about my pickiness with classic character classes, so I'm just opening it up. Fuck it, man. Dual class wizard, druid, dwarf, cat man with pistols and like fucking glow sticks. All right? That's my character. His name is Marl Tarnbarl. He's a cat folk, monkey, dual class, fighter mage. Rogue wizard. All right. So those things are awesome. Monsters are awesome. They have a huge catalog of monsters. And then if you get into the codex, some even deeper detail on some of the cooler races like boggards and so forth. Goblins. You know you want a boggard shaman in your game. So how do you get that in D&D 5th Edition? How do you convert it? That's the question I'm answering tonight. You don't. You don't convert it. You stick it right in as is. Okay. So now what you're going to do is catch up with me on how I came to this conclusion. You're going to get these two books. Pathfinder Bestiary 1 and... Oh, uh, hey baby. You look good. You looking at me? <laughs> don't be like that. D&D 5th Edition Monster Manual, my favorite book. Get these two books and open them to the same effing monster. Okay, let's start with the Cyclops. I mean, everybody loves the Cyclops. If they try to, if you go for the eye poke, 
This doesn't work with the Cyclops, unless you're going for a double finger eye poke. But who would, who honestly would do a double finger eye poke? Okay, so we got Cyclops, Cyclops. Now, right away, you're gonna notice, whoa, challenge ratings are different. Oh, shit. <laughs> now, the crazy thing to do is figure out a bunch of insane math to get yourself to where these challenge ratings are gonna be the same. Or even crazier, what the fuck do you do with a challenge rating? Ask yourself that honestly as the dungeon master. What do you really do with a challenge rating? Maybe you look up uh, treasure output. Maybe you tell the players so that they freak out. Maybe you multiply it by 10 and get the hit points. Maybe you multiply it by 20 and get the hit points. I don't know. Now, I've heard legends of a thing where you get APL and you use it to devise the appropriate CR for the encounter, then generate the amount of XP you can spend to build the monsters in said encounter to uh, determine the harmonic difficulty that you desire for said encounter. Oh my god! Seriously? People are doing that? That is insane! Okay, so move on to another monster. Before we start making any, any theses here, how about ye old Dark Mantle? Everybody loves ye old Dark Mantle, right? Hides on the ceiling, comes on down. First of all, what the? The art is different. Unacceptable. How do I convert this art into this art? Okay. Challenge rating one half, challenge rating one. He's doubly difficult. <laughs> okay, now take a closer look. XP value 400, XP value 100. Ooh, dirty. AC 15, AC 11. Hmm, wait, maybe there's a trend here. Maybe everything in Pathfinder is higher numbers and harder. Wrong! Patty cake, patty cake, you can can can. You will find some monsters that are far lower challenge rating in Pathfinder than they are in D&D. Is that because the math of the systems are different or in conflict somehow? No! It just means that they had a slightly different take on how that creature fits into the spectrum of difficulty in the game. There are some slight differences in the number of details you're going to get per monster. In Pathfinder, you're going to get more details. You don't need those details. You, if you look, you will find that a lot of the description of the fundamental actions, multi-attack, the hit points, the saves, the XP value, the armor class are very close to one another in these two books. And the difference is just going to be fun. You could run a night of D&D 5th edition right out of this book and be totally fine. You know how I know? Because everything that I pull out of here, I either nerf or, or buff anyway to fit the tone of the encounter. One of um, Chris Perkins' great tips, or was it Mike Merle's? Anyway, one of those cool guys. They said never just use a dry monster, always put a descriptor in front of its name so that a player who knows these monster stats well can't call you out on it. So you don't just say Night Hag, you say Monkey Tooth, the aged Night Hag. That means I modded this monster. I mod all my monsters just about to fit about where they should be in the story tone of my night or my room. So if I want a Pathfinder monster and it's coming in a little hot, I nerf a couple of the numbers. That's it. That is it. So if you've got a whole campaign from Pathfinder and you love it, it's that whole goblin thing, you know, where everybody plays goblins or something. It's all awesome. And you're like, oh my God, I need to convert all this over to D&D 5th edition. By the time you even get started understanding how to do some kind of accurate mathematic conversion, you're going to be either out of time, pooped, or just mad. Let's say, I'm just going to take this guy right out of here. And if the XP level is too high, or the armor class is a little tougher, or maybe their damage is lower, which is something that you'll find in Pathfinder versus 5th edition. Fine! So what? So a Chimera is like two challenge levels harder in D&D than it is in Pathfinder. Oh no! I better go figure out some math and ruin my night. No! You're not going to do that. You're going to keep it simple and do it the badass way. Which is you're going to let these two intermingle. Now where it's going to get a little more interesting is when you get into characters. You're going to have a player who wants to make a character out of Pathfinder. Okay? Now that's totally alright. 
but you're going to have to check and double check that character at each level to make sure that he doesn't scale crazy. Because if you do let a Pathfinder player character scale straight out of the book with 5th edition characters hanging out, they will get left behind. He has very high bonus calcing. You're in the plus teens on stuff at 5th and 6th level, which is not like 5th edition, right? But for monsters, you're fine. So, uh, help your players out if they want to do a Pathfinder character and put it in your 5th edition game. Keep your eye on it and just use other characters as examples. Well, this other guy is kind of like you and his hit points are about blah. So, this, you know, you just leveled up, so roll a d8. Take that. The biggest bonus in this entire group is plus 8, and you're telling me that you're going to have a plus 12 next level. We're going to nerf that back a little bit and keep you balanced. And just be open with the player. He's going to love you for it because he's got his cat folk, half dwarf, druid, wizard, ranger with pistols. Right? So, this may not be the most substantive thesis that I ever had, but I've noticed that some of the videos really help people break mental blocks. And this block of these game systems are these perfect harmonic mathematic masterpieces and if, if I don't bring it over just so, the whole thing's gonna fly wildly out of control. It, this is not the case. Wheel and just notice a few numbers next to a guy and scrawl down a monster or an enemy and play it in your game and it would still be awesome. It has nothing to do with the same stat set. It's just what can get your DM brain turning. So if you're getting ready to do something like this, just make sure you've got all your fundamentals down pat. You've got D20 success rolls. You've got a sense for the room challenge level, right? And then that sense can rise and fall. If it's a DC 12 room, every once in a while you can say, hey man, this is a little harder. It's a 14 for this roll. It's not the end of the world. Go with it. So if you have those basics, how to get damage, how to keep the table moving, how to make time feel pressured, how to move monsters in and attack with them fairly, kill them off and get rid of them fairly, how to track their hit points, how to do it all out in the open so you're not tricking players into how difficult things really are. If you got all that under command, it's going to be no problem to say, hey man, I need a yellow musk creeper and I'm going to go retrieve it out of my Pathfinder book. And since we're right here at the table playing, there's no conversion going to happen. I'm going to look it up. And if you guys think I'm crazy, I, I strongly recommend trying. Here's Yellow Musk Creeper. I love this. I strongly recommend trying this experience of getting both the, the Bestiary for Pathfinder and the Monster Manual for 5th Edition. And just go monster by monster, moving and comparing. You'll find that some are higher, some are lower. Some are bigger, some are smaller. Some are faster. Some, and then you realize this is all kind of totally interchangeable. And I think this is probably what D&D doesn't want you to think about. Everything you have in your old 3.5 library, or even second edition library, everything in your Pathfinder library, and everything you're collecting for your D&D 5th edition game, it's all totally interchangeable with no conversion. I know, this is heresy to some. And you know, there are a few people that are watching the channel that are interacting with me and are just like, what the hell, dude? Uh, I, got, I got a call out DMD Basement, who's been great to engage me in an awesome conversation. He's saying, man, you like so few things about DMD 5th edition, why don't you sh run along and play some other game? You know, you don't like enough things about it to be playing this game, and I, I have to rebuke that view. It's like saying just because you only like a Big Mac that you can't go to McDonald's. I can take as much or a little from any game that I choose and call it whatever the hell I choose and honestly it just becomes a nice big glorious mess for me and my friends to sit around the table, argue about elves, and role play dwarves. Real essence of this episode of Drunkens and Dragons which is let your game just flow from one thing to another. Let it be. If you find an idea, that's the hardest part. Not converting things. The beginning is very difficult because you don't know what you're doing. The middle is difficult because you've already done a lot and you don't know what to do next. The end is difficult because you have to do like the, 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 the piece de la resistance, the, the magnificent climax. How the hell are you going to do that? So every stage of being a dungeon master is difficult. So anything it takes for you to find inspiration, 
do it and just just wildly throw it in your game. Now every once in a while something weird's gonna happen and people ask me a lot of questions about this kind of stuff like whoops I overpowered my fighter character and now he's a level ahead of my other characters. Cool, no big deal, that was probably really exciting but now it's time to reel him in. Just talk to him, just talk to the guy. Just say, hey, you got a little ahead. You got too much loot. Like you got 20 more hit points than the next guy on the pole. So we're gonna nerf your next level up a little bit. And they'll be fine. The key is just to get it out in the open. Admit your own beginnerism. Zen mind, beginner's mind. That's your motto, that's my motto. And I've been doing this for decades. It just gives you a feeling of fun and that is the essence, that's the root from which you're drawing your Dungeon Master nutrients. Ah, yes. Ah, I see Primeval Thule up there on the bookshelf. So, don't worry about how to convert anything. Don't convert anything. If you're on the spot on the table or if it's during your prep session, just get the stuff, see the stats that you understand and use them and see what happens. Now you don't want a goblin with 1100 hit points. Or maybe you do. Maybe it's like a Thanksgiving parade goblin. Smart enough to, to see those red flags when they come up. You're not gonna do a thousand hit point goblin and be like, whoops, I wonder what went wrong with the math. That's not gonna happen. You're a dungeon master, you're awesome, you're already good at this. You're just going through the experience of realizing you're good at it. So. Grab stuff out of Pathfinder. I know that I've got the Pathfinder bug right now. I am buying up Pathfinder books. I love them, they're so fun to read. Unfortunately, there's a million other super awesome books that people either recommend to me or that I find that I also need to read. You know how to do it. Follow your instincts. Anything that's fun, go mine it. If it's Dungeon World, if it's Pathfinder, if it's Palladium, it's Basic, Simba Room, anything. Go get the good stuff. Find it, play it. There is no such thing as a game system at your table. You're just playing tabletop RPG. You're playing tabletop RPG. You're, you're playing Drunkens and Dragons. <laughs> Peace, strength, honor, Vikings blood. I'll catch you on the next one. I'm out, 5,000. Demons, devils, shadow dragon. Oh, there it was. Ancient Blue Dragon. Ancient Blue Dragon. Ancient Blue Dragon. Beep, 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 beep,